Hey you guys, John Britt here. Hey, I'm going to do a video today uh, as entitled Proce Acquiring and Processing Ceramic Raw Materials. And this is an offshoot of the last video I did on geology, which it appeared that people liked. Uh, and so it was hard to cram it all into 30 minutes, you know. So I thought, well, I got all this stuff. And maybe just looking at this stuff will give you ideas and inspiration to try it on your own. It's really a lot of fun. I don't make massive quantities of these things. I, I just do stuff for fun and uh, see what it does. Learn. I actually learn more about materials by doing this. All right, so the way this will work is, might be slightly chaotic, because as always, I got a lot of stuff, too much stuff. Um, and so I'm gonna talk about ashes, like wood ash and stuff. And I'm, I'm listing all these up there so I don't forget. And then I'll talk about feldspar processing and silica, and then volcanic ash, and then maybe I got some limestone and some clay. And then I'm gonna, First, start with equipment, but I'll also talk about books that might get you inspired and uh, teach you some stuff. And um, and that's it. Another thing I've been excited to do was uh, inspired by my friend Mike is uh, put little pieces of pottery down here, and you can see if you can identify them. I may do prizes later. So, all right, that's the story. I'm gonna move, use this camera, walk around, and show you. And we'll start with equipment. So this is my ball mill, super nice little piece of equipment. Basically it just spins. And so these containers are porcelain and uh, you take this container and you fill it up with these balls. You put your material in there and then you can put your material in dry or wet. I, I mostly do wet so I don't have um, du a t ton of dust. And then I'll put this lid on here and then you lay it down and let it spin for a certain number of hours and it grinds stuff. So if you can get one of those, it's fantastic. Or if you know someone you can borrow one from, that's always good. But my main tool, which I hate to admit, is this sledgehammer and the kiln. And so what I'll do is I'll get saggers like this, just cylinders that I've thrown. And then I'll put the, like this is feldspar, I'll put it in there. And then I will bisque fire that if I have space in my bisque and then I will pull this out. It'll be, it'll have fallen apart a little because what happens is the heat causes it to expand and contract quickly according to geologic terms and that weakens the bonds. And then I can whack this and then I'll get different chips. Uh, and then what I do is I collect them all and I'll run them through a sieve. So here's a sieve I made. It's hardware cloth. Super primitive construction, but you got the idea. And then uh, you can probably do better than me. Some people use like uh, a lid of a, a five-gallon bucket and then, uh, you know, hook the screen to that. You, you do whatever you want. But then you can get sieves. Like this is an old-school sieve. Probably not the best because right now it's rusty. But if you can find a newer one, this one's always good. It's handheld simple. These are classic 40, 80, 120 mesh. Um, and I usually use those if I'm doing wet uh, sieving. These, these ones I probably do dry sieving more. All right, and once you're doing wet sieving, you're probably going to need a plaster bats to um, dry the material. So I I use sometimes these Tupperware things, and I'll just pour plaster in there, and then you then you pull it out. You got your you got yourself a bat. It's real nice. It's got some little feet on it. Uh, that one's small, but you can get bigger ones. This one's also small, but then this is a one I use called a fish mold from uh, Pure and Simple Products. So it's a plastic uh, gizmo. You just pour plaster in there and you have a nice mold to dry uh, your stuff. All right. So let's see what I... Oh, let me just show you here. Okay, so what I do also is... I, there's a feldspar mine up the road from us. So I went over to them and I got some uh, just feldspar from them. A big... A pile of it. Oh, by the way, this, um, I made this with a flanged lid. 
so that's a really good sag or sometimes I just make them like this just this is basically just a cylinder uh, that I threw oh before I go on to the feldspar let me show you this uh, you got to be a little uh, you know practically oriented to do this stuff because there's no, not really a lot of rules out there for you but say I got this dirt from my friend. It's supposed to make an oil spot glaze, but it's, re it's really clay. So if I try to put this on my pot, it might crack off too plastic. So then what I'll often do is I'll put it in my bisque kiln and I'll bisque it. But see what happens. Now I got these hard chunks. Now I'm like, oh man, I bisque it too hot because it kind of fused them together. So then of course, in comes the hammer and I will whack that up a little and then I'll get a powder and then I will sieve that and go from there. So then I have this clay dirt and this is calcine clay dirt and I'll write those on my little buckets. All right, so then what I, so what I did is I went up to the Feldspar company and I got a big bunch of this. This is through the crusher only, no processing. So I got them to give me a five gallon bucket of it. And then I'll run it through like a hardware, my hardware cloth sieve. And then I'll run it through a window screen sieve. And then I'll run it through a coarse 40 mesh, etc. So that's how you process. And I just have all these containers and I write on there. All right. Another way to get interesting feldspar stuff is to call up the mine. This is from the Pacer... Custer Feldspar is in, from South Dakota, and there's a company called Pacer that sells it. And you can call them up, and they sell chips, large chips. And you can get that, or you can get the pea gravel, or you can get this medium. And so these are just different grades of Feldspar uh, Custer, and then you can process that yourself to make it, uh, you know, finer and finer and finer. You can also buy this, it's called F20. There's a, there's other, there's a, you can get also from them, I think this 500 mesh. So, and then what I'll do, so say for instance, I process this feldspar, just pretend I got this from Colorado. Then I would do what I said, crunch it all up, then run it through the ball mill, then I would have this fine powder, which is wet, and then I dry it up, and now I've, now I'm all set. Okay, so it's, if you have a, you, it's good to do it ahead of time because it takes a little while to do all that stuff. But once you've got these containers with it, then you can do a lot of experimenting. All right, now we're going to do ash glazes here. We're going to talk about uh, all these types of ash glazes. I hope I get them all. But one thing to note is this is an excellent book by Phil Rogers. And if you're interested in ash glazes, and what, what it has a lot of is uh, uh, explaining how to do everything. And then it, they'll do analysis of these things like oak ash, beech ash, etc. And then so you have a general idea of what this ash contains. And then this one's even more intense. This is a Tushane uh, uh, ash glazes. Probably, these are probably out of print, but you can get them either at the library or used. But he also has a whole listing. See, unless you have money to have this analyzed, you're not really sure what's in there. But they have a whole, they have pages and pages on this, uh, what's in some of these ashes. Oh, here's, here it is. So they'll tell you. <laughs> Okay, this is leaf ash, and they're going to tell you what beech ash is from a leaf harvested in August or harvested in November, etc. Because leaves absorb, you know, things from the soil. So that's for people who are super into it. But people like me, we will just uh, burn stuff in our fireplace, and then I will sieve it through with my... Uh, uh, my coarse sieves, uh, like here's how it might look in the beginning, have all these uh, chunks of charcoal. And then I run it through a sieve and then it might look like that. And then I may, uh, I may do even a finer sieve if I want. But another way that I'll do it is I will just burn 
This was from my friend Rob. He has a um, wood burning stove, and he um, burnt only hickory in the stove in the winter. And then he collected the ash for me. And then this was a, a walnut ash. And then this was applewood ash. Uh, and I do the same thing. I'll do poplar or locust or uh, all the woods that we have. Uh, this is this is charcoal ash from my grill. And so that's like hickory. Uh, I don't know what kind of, you know, you can, whatever kind of charcoal you're buying, that's what the ash is. And that's excellent for, um, for a way to easily collect weird ashes. All right. So then what I do sometimes is I will, most of the time I don't wash it, but if I do, it may end up being like this. I will wet it up, fill this bucket up, wait overnight, pour the, the water will be dirty looking, pour it out, put the water in again, do it about five times and then the water will be clear. Then I just take that material and put it in my mold and that'll dry it. And then I put it here and collect it. And then, you know, one time I uh, saw a thing that said, if you ball mill your ash, it'll change the types of rivulets. So I, this is washed ash that was ball milled for two hours. Okay. Now, before I get into more of this, let me say something about melt tests. So since you don't really know what's in there, so a good way to do it is to have melt tests. So this is a standard melt test where I put on Custer Feldspar, K200, NC4. This is very old because that's not available anymore. That is like 25 years old, but it's a great little deal here for understanding materials. Here's Red Art. Here's Barnard. And that helps you to see what Feldspars look at Cone 10. Here's felt. These are Feldspars that I buy from the ceramic company. This will be uh, at cone six, and this is probably cone eight because it was I soaked it. But you can see the different colors. But it's good to have a thing like this so when you do your own um, uh, melt test, you'll you'll be able to compare it. So like here, I can see this is a feldspar I had. You can see it's pretty good. It's a uh, it's very close to the glassy state of these. Whereas these, this is called pumice, and this is another type of pumice. And you can see the impurities in there. It's kind of green and black. And so pumice is a volcanic ash, and it's not really as pure as uh, other feldspars. And here's a type of feldspar called rotten stone, and it's got a lot of iron and magnesium. Anyway, these melt tests are fantastic uh, way to look at your materials. You just put a little ball on there. Usually I use a melon ball scooper and then fire it. Now this is shale. Shale is also known as clay. Clay is also a type of clay as red art. And a type of clay is barn art. And so that helps you compare. You can see how many, uh, how much stuff is in this barn art, like a lot of manganese and iron compared to this red art, probably more aluminum and silica in there. And then here's the one we had from a, a dig we did. So it's also got pretty much, it's very metallic-y feeling, so it's pretty strong. Okay? So that's what you do with melt tests. And then you would do some progressions and line blends and stuff and figure out your materials. All right, so let's talk about this. This is a great book, Glazes from Natural Sources by Brian Sutherland. He goes through all this stuff in here, explains everything. This is a good book, Geology, Roadside Geology to Finding Materials at Roadsides. And then, of course, Daniel Rhodes. And then also uh, Cardew had a good book called Pioneer Potter. Uh, and you can go to the geologic survey in your area. Um, okay. So now what I'm going to tell you is... Uh, I'm not going to do these just yet. Well, I guess I'll do them. Uh, this is... I got this Salisbury pink granite dust... Uh, I'm not exactly positive, but I think it was from a place that 
made granite countertops and they sawed them. And so you just go under the saw and you can get a scoop of this. And this is our road bond, we call it. That's what's on the rope. And if you go to the bottom of a hill, all the fine particles will be right there. And that's definitely, that's nice. That's a gr type of granite from around here. And then I ran that through an 80 mesh sieve. Okay, so that's a couple easy ways to get stuff. And then this is granite from a, a, a feed store's chicken grit. You can get different sizes, and then, um, so that's what chickens will eat for their gullet. So that's super easy to get. Now, let's see, okay, let's see, silica. I got this silica from a mine here. They they have sand, and um, it's, pro it's processed, but they just kind of get rid of it because there's too much of it. So I go collect it, and then I run it through different sieves. You can see what they look like. Uh, you can buy this F95, and then I put this through the ball mill. You can get 400 mesh silica. You can get amorphous silica that you can buy. Here is silica sand, play sand. I would not really use this probably unless I tested it pretty well because there's a lot of impurities in there, and um, maybe um, it's just it's be like getting sand from the beach. There's a lot of impurities of like seashells and. Uh, you know, creatures in there, so it would, it, that's uh, calcium. So it'll be very, it'll be much more, it's not exactly pure silica, put it that way. All right, so <laughs> let's do the limestone. Limestone is like pretty easy. I would, I lived in White Rock, I lived in Dallas, so White Rock Lake was there and they had limestone. So I grabbed a chunk, ground it up, then I did, I was Virginia and Kentucky, there's a lot of limestone. And you can see how different they are. Another thing that's real easy to get is all this clay, sometimes known as slip. So you can buy this Ohio slip at the store. You can buy Michigan's, well, I used to be able to buy Michigan slip. You could get um, uh, Raven Scrag slips from Canada. Albany slip, Alberta slip, Barnard, Arroyo slip substitutes. Those are all things you can purchase, but they help your glazes be unusual. So, but back to collecting. And then I would, when I was driving down the road, I got some of this clay from a road cut in Ohio. Process that. You can see how different it is from this stuff that I bought. And then this was from Wyoming. I, I found a road cut. This stuff is the stuff I just saw by the road cut. It's Johnson City, Tennessee, and I dug it up. And then I ball milled it and processed it. And then I have this, it's like a, it's like a clay source. So that's very good, that's pretty easy to do. And I said Michigan Slip, I don't think they make that anymore. That's from a, you know, old timer. Uh, and then I ca I'll calcine it. So I'll probably take this Ohio Slip and then I'll calcine it. You see how it changes colors, but that way I don't get too much crawling. All right, I think I talked about all the ash. <laughs> so this now is into, uh, rice hull ash is like, it's from rice uh, hulls that they burn uh, or they don't. This is unburnt, so you can see how black it is. I mean, it's burnt a little, but not enough to burn out all the carbon. So what I do is I put it in a biskiln and calcine it. And then it, it's just the, uh, it's super high in silica, like 99% silica. And just so you know, you can buy it. People have told me that this stuff, green sweep is uh, rice hull ash. And it's all in there. So it's very easy to just buy a bag. All right. So. I think that's pretty good. Now, what I'll show you is stuff that I do here is like I will get just materials. So Portland cement, that is a form of calcium. So I have some of that. I can order pumice from this company called Hess, and they're in Idaho, and they have many grades of it, FF, F. This is one half, and then th those will give you different effects in a glaze. And so, 
Uh, let's see, I will take seashells, I'll collect them at the seashore, and I will then calcine them. So that means it's, uh, they break up easier. I didn't, I don't have these open, and I don't think I can open them without dropping this thing, but you got the basic idea. I've done it with eggshells. Back in the day when Mount St. Helens was around, this is a type of pumice, and so here it's it looks like this and somebody else sent me some so that was a different color so that's something to remember about you know volcanic stuff it's variable so you may get something just down the road or 10 100 miles away or whatever they'll all be different and then i made a kiln uh so i saved my soft fire brick dust so that's really high alumina and silica all right, wow, did I do all that? Whiting, yeah. Okay, that was much faster than I thought. All right, let me look and see and make sure I got everything. So I told you about the books. I told you about all the equipment. Okay, so the volcanic ash, the limestone, all the clays. I'm going to do, uh, this is this is all, I talked about dry clays. I'm going to talk about finding wet clays next time. We're going to talk about clay next time. All right, so silica. I get mine locally. Uh, uh, diatomaceous earth is a, a, a form of silica. This little diatomes are in there, so you can buy that. I think I did the feldspar. And the last thing I didn't talk about here was this uh, straw ash. So you can uh, make a little cinder block uh, enclosure, you know, set up a couple cinder blocks. I, I usually put cinder blocks at the bottom and then I can put like, uh, get a bale of straw, put it in there, burn it, and then you can collect it very easy. Okay, all right, well, I think that's it. And we will see you next time. Make a thousand uh, pots out of your feldspar, local feldspar. And if you can see what kind of pottery I got here, we'll have a contest sometime. All right.